This is Don Pearson from the Malamute Saloon in Esther City, Alaska, doing some of your favorite Robert Service stories. I think one that made him one of the most famous poets of the North Country was The Spell of the Yukon. I wanted the gold and I sought it. I scrabbled and mucked like a slave. Was it famine or scurvy? I fought it. I hurled my youth into a grave. I wanted the gold and I got it. Came out with a fortune last fall. Yet somehow life's not what I thought it. And somehow the gold isn't all. No, there's a land. Have you seen it? It's a cussed land that I know. From the big dizzy mountains that screen it to the deep death-like valleys below. Some say God was tired when he made it. Some say it's a fine land to shun. Maybe. But there are some as would trade it for no land on earth. And I'm one. You come to get rich. Damn good reason. You feel like an exile at first. You hate it like hell for a season. And then you are worse than the worst. It grips you like some kind of sinning. It twists you from foe to a friend. It seems it's been since the beginning. It seems it will be to the end. I've stood in some mighty mouthed hollow that's plumb full of husk to the brim. I've watched the big husky sun wallow in crimson and gold and grow dim till the moon set the pearly peaks gleaming and the stars tumbled out neck and crop. And I've thought that I surely was dreaming with the peace of the world piled on top. The summer, no sweeter was ever. The sunshiny woods all a thrill. The grayling a leap in the river. The big horn a sleep on the hill. The strong life that never knows harness. The wilds where the caribou call. The freshness, the freedom, the farness. Oh God, how I'm stuck on it all. The winter, the brightness that blinds you. The white land locked tight as a drum. The cold fear that follows and finds you. The silence that bludgeons you dumb. The snows that are older than history. The woods where the rude shadows slant. The stillness. The moonlight. The mystery. I have bade him goodbye, but I can't. There's a land where the mountains are nameless. And the rivers all run God knows where. There are lives that are erring and aimless. And deaths that just hang by a hair. There are hardships that nobody reckons. There are valleys unpeopled and still. There's a land. Oh, it beckons and beckons. And I want to go back. And I will. They're making my money diminish. I'm sick of the taste of champagne. Thank God, when I'm skinned to a finish, I'll pike to the Yukon again. I'll fight. You bet it's no sham fight. It's hell. But I've been there before. And it's better than this by a damn sight. So me for the Yukon once more. There's gold, and it's haunting and haunting. It's luring me on as of old. Yet it isn't the gold that I'm wanting, so much as just finding the gold. It's the great, big, broad land way up yonder. It's the forest where silence has lease. It's the beauty that thrills me with wonder. It's the stillness that fills me with peace. Probably one of the most famous stories that Robert Service has done, and the most popular, I'm sure, was a story done in the Malamute Saloon, the shooting of Dan McGrew. A bunch of the boys were whooping it up in the Malamute Saloon. The kid that handles the music box was hitting a jag time tune. Back at the bar in a solo game sat dangerous Dan McGrew, and watching his luck was his light of love. The lady that's known as Lou. When from out of the night, which was fifty below, and into the din and the glare, there stumbled a miner fresh from the crick, dog dirty and loaded for bear. He looked like a man with one foot in the grave, and scarcely the strength of a louse. But he tilted a poke of dust on this bar and called for drinks for the house. There was none could place the stranger's face, though we searched ourselves for a clue. But we drank his health. And the last to drink was dangerous Dan McGrew. Now there's men that somehow just grip your eyes and hold them there like a spell. And such was he. And he looked to me like a man who had lived in hell. 
with a face most hair and the dreary stare of a dog whose day is done, as he watered the green stuff in his glass, and the drops fell one by one. I got to figuring who he was and wondering what he'd do, and I turned my head, and there watching him was a lady that's known as Lou. His eyes went rubbering round the room, he seemed in kind of a daze, until at last the old piano fell in the way of his wandering gaze. The ragtime kid was having a drink, and there was no one else on the stool. So the stranger stumbles across the room and flops down there like a fool, in a buckskin shirt all glazed with dirty sat, and I saw him sway. Then he clutched the keys with his talon hands. My God, but that man could play. Were you ever out in the great alone, when the moon was awful clear, and the icy mountains hemmed in with a silence your most could hear, and the lonely howl of the timber wolf, and you camped there in the cold, a half-dead thing in a stark dead world, clean that for that muck called gold. While high overhead, green, yellow, and red, the north lights swept in bars. They knew the hunch what the music meant. Hunger and night and the stars. But not the hunger of the bellies kind that's banished with bacon and beans, but the gnawing hunger of lonely men for a home and all that it means. For a fireside far from the cares that are, four walls and a roof above. But oh, so crammed full of cozy joy, and crowned with a woman's love, a woman dearer than all the world, and true as heaven is true. God, how ghastly she looks through a rouge, the lady that's known as Lou. All on a sudden, the music changed, so soft your scarce could hear, but you felt your life had been looted clean of all that it once held dear, that someone had stolen the woman you loved, that her love was a devil's lie that your guts were gone, and the best for you was to crawl away and die. T'was a crowning cry of a heart's despair, and it thrilled you through and through. I guess I'll make it a spread misere, said dangerous Dan McGrew. The music almost died away, then it burst like a pent-up flood, and it seemed to say, repay, repay, and my eyes went blind with blood. The thought came back of an ancient wrong, and it stung like a frozen lash, and the lust awoke to kill, to kill. Then the music stopped with a crash, and the stranger turned. In his eyes, they burned in a most peculiar way. In a buckskin shirt, all glazed with dirty sat, and I saw him sway. Then his lips went in a kind of a grin, and he spoke, and his voice was calm. Boy, said he, you don't know me, and none of you give a damn. But I'm here to state, and my words are straight, and I'll bet my poke they're true, that one of you is a hound of hell, and that one is Dan McGrew. I ducked my head, and the lights went out, and two guns blazed in the dark. A woman screamed, and the lights went up, and two men lay stiff and stark, and pitched on his head. And pump for lead was dangerous Dan McGrew. While a man from the cricks lay clutched to the breast of the lady that's known as Lou. Now these are the simple facts of the case, and I guess I ought to know. They say the stranger was crazed with hooch, and I'm not denying that so. I'm not so wise as these lawyer guys, but strictly between us few, the woman who kissed him and pinched his poke was the lady that's known as Lou. Another popular favorite of Robert Service was a story of the cremation of Sam McGee. Now Sam McGee was from Tennessee where the cotton blooms and blows. And why he left his home in the south to roam round the pole, God only knows. He was always cold. But the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell, though he'd often say in his homely way that he'd sooner live in hell. On a Christmas day we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail, and talkier cold, 
through the parka's folded stab like a driven nail. Uh, if our eyes would close and the lashes froze, till sometimes we couldn't see. It wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. That very night, as we lay packed tight in our rows beneath the snow, the dogs were fed and the stars ahead were dancing heel and toe, he turned to me and Cap says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess. And if I do, I'm asking you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low that I couldn't say no. Then he says with sort of a moan, It's a cursed cold and it's got right hold of I'm chill, clear through to the bone. You pink being dead. It's an awful dread of the icy grave that pains. So I want you to swear that foul or fair, you'll cremate my last remains. Well, a pal's last need is a thing to heed, so I swore I would not fail. And he started on at the speaker door, but God, he looked ghastly pale. He crouched in the sleigh and he raved all day at his home in Tennessee. And before nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death. And I hurried, horror-driven, with a corpse half hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was lashed to the sleigh. But it seemed to say you may tax your brawn and brain. But you have promised true, and it's up to you to cremate those last remains. Now a promise made is a debt unpaid. And the trail has its own stern code. In the days to come, though my lips were dumb, in my heart, how I cursed that load. In the long, long night, by the lone firelight, while the huskies round in the ring howled out their woes to the homeless snows. Oh, God, how I load that thing. And every day that quiet clay seemed heavy and heavier grow. And on I went till the dogs were spent, and the grub was growing low. The trail was bad, and I felt half mad. But I swore I would not give in. And it often seemed to the hateful thing, and it hearkened with a grin, till I came to the marge of Lake LaBarge, and there a derelict lay, it was jammed in the ice, but I saw in a trice it was called the Alice May, and I looked at it, and I thought a bit, and I looked at my frozen chum, then here, said I, with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. Some planks I tore from the cabin floor and lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found was lying around and heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared and the furnace roared. Such a blaze you seldom see. And I burrowed a hole in that glowing coal. And I stuffed in Sam McGee. Then I made a hike because I couldn't stand to hear him sizzle so. And the heavens scowled and huskies howled the wind began to blow. It was icy cold. But the hot sweat rolled down my cheeks, and I don't know why. And that greasy smoke and an inky cloak went streaking down the sky. I, I do not know how long the snow I wrestled with grisly fear. But the stars came out and they danced about. And again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said I'll just take a peep inside. I guess he's cooked and it's... Time I looked. Then the door I opened wide, and there sat Sam looking cool and calm in the heart of the furnace roar, and he wore a smile he could see a mile. And he said, please close that door. It's fine in here, but I greatly fear you let in the cold and storm. Since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warm. Another favorite of mine, by Robert Service, is the ballad of blasphemous Bill Mackay. I took a contract to bury the body of blasphemous Bill Mackay, whenever, wherever, or whatsoever the manner of death he die. Whether he die in the light of day or under the peak-faced moon, in a cabin or dance hall, camp or dive, mucklucks or patent tune, on velvet tundra or virgin peak, by glacier drift or draw, in a muskeg hollow or canyon gloom, by avalanche fang or claw, by battle, 
murder or sudden wealth, by pestilence, hooch or lead. I swore on the book I would follow and look till I found my tombless dead. For Bill was a dainty kind of a cuss, and his mind was mighty sot. On a dinky patch was flowers and grass, in a civilized boneyard lot. And where he died, or how he died, it didn't matter a damn. So as long as he had a grave with frills and a tombstone epigram. So I promised him, and he paid the price in good chichaco coin, which the same I blowed in that very night down in the tenderloin. Then I painted a three-foot slab of pine. Here lies poor Bill Mackay. And hung it up on my cabin wall. And I waited for Bill to die. Years passed away, and at last one day came a squaw with a strange story of a long-deserted line of traps way back at the Bighorn Range, of a little hut by the Great Divide and a white man stiff and still, lying there by his lonesome self, and I figured it must be Bill. So I thought of the contract I'd made with him, and I took down from the shelf the swell black box with the silver plate he picked out for himself. And I packed it full of grub and hooch, and I swung it on the sleigh. Then I harnessed up my team of dogs, and was off at the dawn of day. You know what it's like in the Yukon wild when it's 69 below, when the ice worms wriggle their purple heads through the crust of the pale blue snow. When the pine trees crack like guns in the silence of the wood, and the icicles hang down like tusks under the parka hood. When the stovepipe smoke breaks sudden off and the sky is weirdly lit and the careless feel of a bit of steel burns like a red-hot spit. When the mercury is a frozen ball and the frost fiend stalks to kill. Well, it was just like that, that day when I set out to look for Bill. Oh, the awful hush that seemed to crush me down on every hand as I blundered blind with a trail to find through that blank and bitter land half dazed, half crazed in the winter wild, with its grim heartbreaking woes, and the ruthless strife for a grip on life that only the sourdough knows. North by the compass, north I pressed, river and peak and plain, past like a dream I slept to lose, and I wake to dream again. River and plain and mighty peak, and who could stand unawed as her summits blazed, he could stand undazed at the foot of the throne of God. North, aye, north, through a land accursed, shunned by the scouring brutes. And all I heard was my own harsh word and the whine of the Malamutes. Till at last I came to a cabin squat built on the side of the hill, and I burst in the door and there on the floor, frozen to death was Bill. Ice, white ice, like a winding sheet, Sheathing each smoke-grimed wall. Uh, ice on the stovepipe, ice on the bed, uh, ice gleaming over all. Sparkling ice on the dead man's chest, glittering ice in his hair. Ice on his fingers, ice in his heart, ice in his glassy stare. Hard as a log and trussed like a frog, with his arms and legs outspread. I gazed at the coffin I'd bought for him, and I gazed at the gruesome dead. And at last I spoke. Bill liked his joke, but still gall darn his eyes. A man had ought to consider his mates in the way he goes and dies. Have you ever stood in an Arctic hut in the shadow of the pole with a little coffin six by three in a grief you can't control? Have you ever sat by a frozen corpse that looks at you with a grin and that seems to say, you may try all day, but you'll never jam me in. I'm not a man of the quitting kind, but I never felt so blue as I sat there gazing at that stiff and studying what I'd do. Then I rose and kicked off the husky dogs that were nosing round about, and I lit a roaring fire in the stove, and I started to thaw Bill out. Well, I thawed and thawed for thirteen days, and it didn't seem no good. His arms and legs stuck out like pegs, as if they was made of wood. To the last I said, it ain't no use. He's froze too hard to thaw. He's obstinate, and he won't lie straight. So I guess I've got to saw. 
So I sawed off poor Bill's arms and legs and I laid him snug and straight in the little coffin he picked himself with the dinky silver plate. And I came nigh near to shed my tears and nailed him safely down. And I stowed him away in my Yukon sleigh and I started back to town. So I buried him as the contract was in a narrow grave and deep. And there he's waiting the great cleanup when the judgment sluice head sweep. And I smoke my pipe and I meditate in the light of the midnight sun. And sometimes I wonder if there ever was the awful things I had done. And as I sit in the parson talks, expounding of the law, I often think of poor old Bill and how hard he was to saw. This is a story by Robert Service for people with a religious bent. The Ballad of Salvation Bill. It was in the blurry middle of the hard-boiled Arctic night. I was lonesome as a loon, so if you can, imagine my emotions of amazement and delight when I bumped into that missionary man. He was lying lost and dying in the moon's unholy leer and frozen from his toes to fingertips. The famished wolf pack ringed him, but he didn't seem to fear, as he pressed his ice-bound Bible to his lips. T'was the limit of my trap line with the cabin miles away, and every step was like a stab of pain. But I packed him like a baby, and I nursed him night and day, till I got him back to health and strength again. So there we were, benighted in the shadow of the pole, and he might have proved a priceless little pard, if he hadn't gotten to worrying about my blessed soul and quoting me his Bible by the yard. Now there was I, a husky guy whose God was nicotine, with a coffin nail a fixture in my mug. I rolled him in the pages of a pulpwood magazine, and I hacked him with my jackknife from the plug. For oh to know the bliss and glow that good tobacco means, just live among the everlasting ice. So judge my horror. When I found my stock of magazines was chewed into a chowder by the mice. A woeful week went by and not a single pill I had. Me that would smoke my forty in a day. I sighed, I swore, I strode the floor. I felt I would go mad. The gospel plugger watched me in dismay. My brow was wet, my teeth were set, my nerves were rasping raw. And yet, that preacher couldn't understand. So with despair I wrestled there, when suddenly I saw the volume he was holding in his hand. Then something snapped inside my brain, and with an evil start, the wolf man in me woke to rabid rage. I saved your lousy life, says I, so show you have a heart, and tear me out a solitary page. He shrank and shriveled at my words. His face went pewter white. It was just as if I'd handed him a blow. And then, and then he seemed to swell and grow to heaven's height. And then a voice said rang. He answered, no. I grabbed my loaded rifle and I jabbed it in his chest. Come on, you shrimp, give up that book, says I. Well, sir, he was a parson, but he stacked up with the best. And for grit, I got to hand it to the guy. If I should let you desecrate this holy word, he said, my soul would be eternally accursed. So go on, Bill, I'm ready. You can pump me full of lead and take it. But you got to kill me first. Now I'm no fool assassin, though I'm full of sinful ways. And I knew right there the fellow had me beat. For I felt a yellow mongrel in the glory of his gaze. And I flung my foolish firearm at his feet. Then wearily I turned away and dropped upon my bunk. And there I lay and blubbered like a kid. Forgive me, pard, says I at last, for acting like a skunk. But hide the blasted rifle, which he did. And he also hid his Bible, which was maybe just as well, for the sight of all that paper gave me pain. And there were crimson moments when I felt I'd go to hell to have a single cigarette again. And so I lay day after day and brooded dark and deep until one night I thought it ended all. Then rough I aroused the preacher where he stretched pretending sleep with his map of horror turned towards the wall. 
See here, my pious pal, says I, I've stood it long enough. Behold, I've mixed some strychnine in a cup, enough to kill a dozen men. Believe me, it's no bluff. Now watch me, for I'm going to drink it up. You've seen me bludgeon by despair through bitter days and nights, and now you'll see me squirming as I die. You're not to blame. You've played the game according to your lights. But how would Christ have played it? Well, goodbye. With that, I raised a deadly drink and laid it to my lips. But he was on me with a tiger bound. And as we locked and reeled and rocked with wild and wicked grips, the poison cup went crashing to the ground. Don't do it, Billy, madly shrieked. Maybe I acted wrong. See, here's my Bible. Use it as you will. But promise me, you'll read a little as you go along. You do? Then take it, brother. Smoke your fill. And so I did. I smoked and smoked from Genesis to Job. And as I smoked, I read each blessed word. While in the shadow of his bunk, I heard him sigh and sob. And then a most peculiar thing occurred. I got to reading more and more and smoking less and less till just about the day his heart was broke. Says I, here, take it back, me lad. I've had enough, I guess. Your paper makes a mighty rotten smoke. So then and there, with plea and prayer, he wrestled for my soul, and I was racked and ravished by regrets. But God was good, for lo, next day, there came the police patrol with paper for a thousand cigarettes. So now I'm called Salvation Bill. I teach the living law and ballyhoo the Bible with the best. And if a guy won't listen, why I sock him on the jaw and preach the gospel sitting on his chest. Robert Service wrote a lot of serious stories about the North Country and other places. He also wrote a lot of humor about the North Country and other places. Here's what I consider probably one of his most humorous pieces. Bessie's Boyle, a Lancashire ballad. Says I to my missus, Bog good lassie of something on your mind, I see. Says she, you're right, Sam, of something, but it happens to be on me behind. A boil as it make Joe be jealous. It hurts me no end when I sit, says I. Go to hospital, missus. They might have to cut it a bit. Says she, I just hate to be showing the part of me person it's at. Says I, don't be fussy. Them doctors see sights far more horrid than that. So missus goes off togged up tasty, and then at the hospital door, they tells her to see the house doctor, whose office is room 34. So she runs up and down till she finds it and knocks, and a voice says, come in. And there is an handsome young fella, in white from his heels to his chin. I've got a big boy, says my missus. It hurts me for fair when I sit. And Sam, that's me husband, has asked me to ask you to cut it a bit. Then blushing, she plucks up her courage and bravely she shows him the place. He gives it a proper inspection with a heap of surprise on his face. Then he says with accent of Scotland, what you have is a boy I can feel, but you better consult the head doctor. They call him Professor O'Neill. He's special for bios and carbuncles. You'll find him in room 63. No charge, ma'am. It's been a real pleasure. Just tell him you're coming from me. So Mrs. She thanks him politely and runs up and down as before till she comes to a big handsome room with Professor O'Neill on the door. Then once more she plucks up her courage and knocks and the voice says, all right. So she enters and sees a fat fellow with whiskers, all togged up in white. I've got a big boy, says my missus, and if you'll kindly permit, I'd like for to have you inspect it. It hurts me like oil when I sit. So blushing as red as a beetroot, she hastens to show him the spot. And he says, well, I look of amazement. Sure, ma'am, it must hurt you a lot. Then he puts on his specs to regard it. And finally he says with a frown, I'll bet it's as sore as a devil, especially when you sit down. I think it's a case for the surgeon. You better consult Dr. Hoyle. I've no hesitation in saying, your boil is a hell of a boil. 
So missus she thanks him for saying her boil's a hill of a boil, and on so all round, till she comes on a door that's marked Dr. Hoyle. But by now she's fair got her wind up and trembles in every limb, but she thinks after all, he's a doctor. I mustn't be bashful with him. She's made a good stuff as the missus. So she knocks and her voice says, Who's there? It's me, says my Bessie. And enters a room which is spacious and bare, and a wise-looking old fella greets her, and he too is togged up in white. It's a room where they cut you, thinks Bessie, and shakes like a jelly with fright. I've got a big boil, begins missus, and if you're sure you don't mind, I'd like you to see it a moment. It hurts me because it's behind. So thinking she best get it over, she hastens to show him the place. And he stares at her kind of surprise like, and gets very red in the face. But he looks at it most conscientious, from every angle of view. Then he says with a shrug of his shoulders, Poor lady, I'm sorry for you. It wants to be cut, but you should have one of them medical books to do that. Sorry, why don't you go to the hospital, where all them doctors is at? You see, ma'am, this part of the building is closed on account of repairs. Us fellas is only the painters, a painting the halls and the stairs.